we talked about uh, Renaissance art in the Netherlands and Flanders in the persons of Bosch and Bruegel. And now we want to look at 16th century Renaissance art in Northern Europe in Germany. Undoubtedly, the most famous of all German artists is Albrecht Dürer. He was a German painter and printmaker, and he's particularly known for his prints. One of the things about creating fine art prints in the Renaissance was that these were sold internationally. And so he had an international reputation. People who had never seen a Dürer painting might very well have seen prints by Dürer. He continues the northern style of detailed naturalism, but as we'll see, he also uses the devices of the Italian Renaissance. So it's sort of the bo best of both worlds, uh, the uh, minute observation and uh, reproduction of textures uh, and details from the northern tradition and things like uh, linear perspective, proportions of the human form from the Italian tradition. Indeed, he's known as the Leonardo of the North, um, primarily because he, like Leonardo, was fascinated with the natural world and observed the natural world and kept diaries and notebooks in which he did uh, sketches of you know, various things from the natural world. Now, he was not a scientist in the sense that we look at Leonardo and say, ah, he's using um, the scientific method, uh, empiricism. Um, Dewar is fascinated with the natural world, but he doesn't dissect bodies. Uh, he doesn't discover you know, things about the working of uh, the human body uh, the way Leonardo does. But, as you'll see, uh, he does make some very interesting sketches. These are two sketches. Uh, one, they're both watercolors. Um, the one, as you can see, uh, it's known as a clod of earth or uh, uh, the great turf. You know, just something referring to the fact that it's a, a very close look at, uh, well, essentially at weeds. You can see uh, dandelions, and I usually joke that that looks like my backyard. Uh, but at any rate, uh, you know, it's extremely detailed, extremely close observation. Yeah. And then you have the drawing of uh, the cliff uh, from his travels. Uh, and it's painted with washes and seems so very, very free. I remember the first time I saw the reproduction, I thought how modern it felt. But generally, uh, when we think of Dewar's style, it's very linear, it's very precise. Uh, it's only in the sketches you, that you get this uh, kind of freedom. Okay, we said that Dewar was influenced by the Italian Renaissance. He studied the anatomy of nude figures, although he never dissected any figures. Um, and he was fascinated with the mathematical parts. Um, the ideal human proportions, and we're going to show you an example of that uh, soon. Also, he was a master of linear perspective. And he also was very interested in the concept of the artist as a genius. He was very conscious of his intellectual and social status. Um, and I should go into that artist as a genius a little bit. Uh, you may remember that at the beginning of the course, I assigned you to read uh, my essay called The Introduction to Art History. And in it, I talked to you uh, about the idea that artists during the Middle Ages, the early Renaissance, were regarded as craftspersons, you know, skilled, but still manual laborers. And during the Renaissance, uh, within humanist circles, the idea grew 
that artists were more than mere craftspersons, uh, that they had intellectual activity, and uh, they could be likened to poets. They even have a phrase, ut pictura poesis. As poetry, so painting. Now, what does this mean? Poets were lauded um, because they were using what words, intellectual activity, and also because they were often believed to be divinely inspired. And so some of the greatest artists were considered to be divinely inspired. Uh, in the 16th century in Italy, uh, Castiglione, for example, uh, refers to Raphael and to Michelangelo as the divine Raphael and the divine Michelangelo. He's not saying that they are literally deities. He's talking about this idea of uh, the great artist, the genius, who is divinely inspired. And of course, the type of art was changing during the Renaissance. Artists had to know more things. They didn't just copy what their master had done before. Um, as you can see, they had to know ideal proportions. They had to st learn uh, you know, how the body worked so they could paint it correctly, the nude figures. Uh, they had to learn the mathematics, both for uh, linear perspective and for uh, figuring out the ratios of uh, ideal proportions. Um, as classical literature expanded, um, they may not have been able to read the Latin and the Greek, but they had to know some of the stories, even if they were told to them by, say, a humanist scholar. Um, so they had to have you know, greater knowledge of uh, literature. And they had to observe the natural world. They had to observe how figures moved. Uh, they had to observe how do you show what was no, known uh, as the movements of the mind. Uh, Alberti, uh, a humanist and an architect, um, wrote a book on painting. And uh, in it, he said the artists were trying to show the movements of the mind. Uh, the idea that the human being is not merely the, you know, the outward physical appearance, um, but in art, as well as what in life, uh, you know, you were trying to show uh, the inner being, the soul, the mind, the thoughts, the emotions. So, you know, we might even say the artist had to understand, today we'd use the word psychology to understand uh, how the emotions or the thoughts uh, could be reflected in the outward appearance um, and in poses, in gestures, in compositions. If they're going to, say, paint a landscape, they have to study the plants. They have to know what they look like. So the artist had to know many more things. So he now has an intellectual status, and in some cases, artists were recognized as geniuses. Uh, this idea comes out of humanist circles, and uh, in particularly the uh, courts, uh, artists were you know, recognized as uh, in geniuses and supporting them would uh, uh, enhance the reputation of the prince. Now, Dewar's best friend, Willibard Perkheimer, was a humanist scholar. And so, you know, in his own friendship, you know, he would be acquainted with this idea. And Dewar had a great deal of confidence, a great deal of belief in his ability that he was a genius. Um, when he went to Italy, you know, he was lauded, he was greeted. When he came back home to Nuremberg, it was like he was just another craftsperson by you know, much of Nuremberg society. And so he was very conscious of that. Well, let me show you an example of linear perspective with Dewar. Uh, this is not in your textbook, uh, but it is one of his woodcuts of the, of the uh, Adoration of the Magi. And you can see uh, we have the uh, image on one side and then a diagram where someone has shown how all of the straight lines that are oblique to the picture surface, that are not parallel to the picture surface, meet at a single vanishing point, uh, approximately in the center of the picture in this case. And so, you know, they've extended the lines. You have the rafters, you have the joints uh, between the blocks of the threshold, you have the edges of the plinth or the pedestal on which the uh, vertical support rests. 
And this has to be figured out mathematically. So it shows that Dewar was a master of linear perspective. We want to take a look at Dewar's self-portrait of 1500. One of the things that Albrecht Dewar does is sign most of his work. Uh, sometimes it's with his monogram. I don't think you can make it out, but it is here in the background. It is 1500, and then his monogram is below it. Uh, it's an A with a kind of flat top, and below the crossbar there is a capital D, so his initials. He signs and dates much of his work. And this, of course, is very helpful to our historians uh, because he, essentially he's documenting himself and he's uh, showing us his development and we know when he created uh, different works of art. Um, so we want to look at this painting. Uh, but first I want to show you, put it kind of in context, that Dewar did a number of self-portraits. In fact, the earliest work of art that we have by Albrecht Dewar is a self-portrait of himself uh, drawn, not painted, but drawn when he was 13 years old. And this is from 1484. It's in silver point. Uh, silver point is a technique uh, in which you have a specially coated paper and you draw on the paper with a stylus that has a silver tip, a silver point. And there's a, a chemical reaction with the coating. Uh, the silver oxidizes, and that is what makes uh, these very, very fine lines. Uh, but it's it's pretty tricky. It's not something that um, you know an unskilled person could do because you're really not seeing exactly what you're drawing. Uh, that emerges as uh, the silver oxidizes. Now, where did Dewar learn to do this at such a young age? His father was a goldsmith, and goldsmiths had to do lots of drawings. So we presumably, uh, his earliest drawing lessons may have been with his father. Uh, but even at the very young age of 13, he's doing what is a you know, pretty remarkable picture for a child, uh, a youth of that age. Uh, now, he will the next year, uh, when you're about 14, is when you become a, an apprentice. Uh, so he was already showing skill. The next picture, from 1493, when he's 22 years old, was painted just before he got married. And he's shown here as a beardless youth, uh, with, uh, you know, shaved presumably, uh, with uh, hair that, I, I would say it looks like it needs to be combed. Um, and then he's holding um, an eryngium, uh, this particular plant, uh, which was associated with, well, as an aphrodisiac. So it has been suggested that this is, uh, you know, a, a foreshadowing of his marriage, you know, that he's painting it on the occasion of his marriage. Uh, it was an arranged marriage uh, to uh, the daughter of another craftsperson. Five years after that, the way he portrays himself is very different. He's shown as a gentleman. He's dressed in clothing that are appropriate for upper middle class, even an aristocratic class. Uh, he's wearing gloves. Uh, you know, uh, and you'll notice his hair uh, is very carefully coffered. Uh, you know, he has these uh, curls. Uh, you know, everything is arranged. By this time, of course, he is growing uh, the, the beard and he's letting the uh, uh, beard uh, as part of his um, appearance. Um, you'll notice they're all three, three-quarter view, which is actually uh, the way, if you think back to Jan van Eyck's Man uh, in the Red Turban, uh, which, you know, many people believe is a uh, self-portrait of Jan van Eyck. Um, if you are working, um, you know, you have to be able, if you're working, drawing a self-portrait, you have to be able to see yourself. Uh, you couldn't, for example, do a profile very easily. Uh, so, you know, he could be looking out of the corner of his eye at the mirror when he draws uh, himself and paints himself. Um, but it's you know, very traditional to show uh, the three-quarter view in northern painting. Uh, the 1498 painting, uh, you'll see, is shown in an interior, in a room, and then there's a window open to a landscape, and this was um, 
a tradition with Netherlandish painters. They often uh, show this. And so he's continuing that tradition here in German painting. So then we come to the self-portrait of 1500. Uh, this is in Munich in the Alta Pinaco take. And it's a relatively small painting. Um, when we look at it, you know, it's frontal. In other words, he faces right out at us. We see you know, the front of his face rather than the profile or a three-quarter view. And his hair is very carefully arranged once again with these curls uh, coming out at uh, kind of an angle from each side of the face, a, a, a very symmetrical composition. Uh, and it, it sort of gives you a triangular or pyramidal um, composition. Now, of course, the head does not come to an exact point. Uh, that would be horrible. Uh, but uh, the, the general appearance of this um, geometric form, which is often used, of course, in Renaissance art uh, to organize a composition. And, of course, we see the best of uh, the northern tradition, if you will, with the detailed naturalism, uh, the uh, details of the fur collar, uh, of the hair. Uh, you know, it's quite different than the, uh, the garment or the flesh. But there's something else. If, like me, you have looked at many, many paintings of the face of Christ in northern art, or the Salvador Mundi, the savior of the world, you will make another association. The first time I saw this painting in Munich, just for a second, I thought it was a picture of Christ. I did sort of a mental double take and said, oh no, it's Albert Dewar. Even though I'd seen reproductions of it before, that was my first mental impression. And if you compare it to a picture of the Salvador Mundi, the savior of the world, you'll see what I mean. So what I've done, I've, I've taken a photograph of uh, a painting uh, by Memlink that is in uh, Antwerp uh, Museum, and uh, it's a detail. You know, um, it also it, it's it's it has more things in it. Uh, it's a larger painting. I'm just showing you this one detail of Christ. Um, he has angels on either side, for example, and he's holding this great crystalline orb, uh, and uh, a large cross comes out of it. And in this uh, detail, you can see just the edge of one of the cross pieces, very elaborate, uh, sort of peeking into the picture, but. When you compare this detail of Christ as the savior of the world with Albrecht Dürer's self-portrait, you'll see what I was talking about. It is a frontal image. The hair is arranged so that it comes out at you know, a slight angle on the diagonal, uh, very symmetrically. And of course, you know, Christ has a very uh, what uh, well-groomed uh, beard, uh, as Dürer does. And you might also notice something about the hands. Christ is blessing. That gesture with two fingers up and the other two fingers held down with the thumb uh, is a blessing gesture. He would be making the, the uh, making a cross with his hands, the sign of the cross. If you look at the gesture endures self-portrait, it looks like he's taken a blessing gesture and turning it around and with the two fingers pointing to himself, indicating himself. It's not perhaps a gesture we might think of as someone with one index finger pointing to himself and say, here I am, or maybe someone with his full hand uh, putting his hand across the breast, you know, to show piety or just you know, to indicate himself. Uh, it looks like he's just turned around the blessing gesture. So, you know, this is, this is fascinating. Why is he doing this? Well, there is a concept which was very strong in uh, the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance. It actually, you know, goes like, in many ways throughout Christianity of the imitation of Christ, the imitatio Christi. Now, that is uh, the name of a book written by Thomas Akempis 
It's one of the most popular books in the Christian world. I read at one time that um, the number of uh, books published of uh, Thomas Kempis's Imitation of Christ was second only to the Bible. Uh, I don't know if that's still true, uh, but uh, I read that some years ago. And in devotional practice, uh, I think I've mentioned this before, um, the pious devotee was supposed to imagine, we would say imagine, um, Ludolf of Saxony in his book on the Vita Christi, the life of Christ, says that uh, you know, the believer must be present by thought. So you know, he would be present by thought or imagine that he was you know, in the presence of Christ or in the presence of Mary uh, to go with them throughout their lives. Uh, Thomas Akempis is uh, preaching to the novices at uh, uh, the monastery of Wil uh, Wildesheim, and he says, um, you know, be with Mary at, I'm paraphrasing, of course, be with Mary at the crucifixion and support her and, you know, care for her, you know, as, as she's suffering. And, you know, if you do this, then, you know, she will reward you. <laughs> um, so there was this idea of... Uh, people being able to empathize with Christ and his followers. You're supposed to, uh, when you see a picture of the suffering Christ, you're supposed to weep and to feel guilt. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. That's my guilt or, you know, my guilt. Um, you know, my guilt, my sin has caused Christ's suffering and death. And essentially, people were told that they should imitate Christ. Now, you know, nobody can completely be Christ-like. You know, we're not perfect. Um, and of course, Christ was believed to be both God and man, so that might be uh, difficult for anyone else to emulate. If, if, uh, but when we see Doer representing representing himself in a pose that is reminiscent of the Savior of the world, or the reminiscent of uh, a picture of Christ. We can see that as a declaration of Dewar's faith. And, you know, as, as though he's saying, I, I want to be like Christ. I want to be, I want to emulate his virtues. There's another idea, too, that Doer is a creator. As God created the world, so in a sense, the painters so recreate the imitation of the world. Now, I told you that Doer was very well known for his prints, so let's look at some of them. Most of his prints are either woodcuts or engravings, uh, but he also did some experimental uh, etchings and I, I think maybe some dry point as well. Um, so we're going to look at um, what he did most of, woodcut, an example of woodcut, and then an example of his engraving. This is probably his most famous woodcut because it's reproduced in virtually all uh, survey books and, uh, you know, of, course, of course, books on Albrecht Dewar. Uh, it's the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and it's from his series of images uh, from the Apocalypse that was published in 1498. Now, some of you know the term the Apocalypse. Uh, you know it refers to things that are devastating and the end of the world uh, in a general sense, uh, but it also, you know, refers to the last book of the Christian Bible, known as the Book of Revelation. And the Book of Revelation is a, a fascinating book. Uh, it is supposed to be the vision that St. John the Evangelist had when he was exiled to the island of Patmos. And in this vision, he sees uh, God on his throne. Um, he sees a book with seven seals, and the lamb, presumably a symbol of Christ, opens the book. And every time he breaks a seal, uh, destruction rains out on mankind. So it's essentially mankind is being killed at the end of the world. And 
Uh, there's uh, also the example of um, the Archangel Michael fighting the dragon that represents uh, the devil. It's told in visionary language, kind of phantasmagorical language. Um, and I'm showing you just a couple of other images from this so you'll get the idea. Uh, one is God as the one on the rainbow throne uh, with uh, stars at his hand. He's holding up the book. Uh, a sword comes from his mouth. The candlesticks represent uh, the churches uh, that were founded uh, in different cities at that time. And there is John the evangelist kneeling uh, before God. Uh, the second example I'm showing you here uh, is a very familiar image uh, that I think I've mentioned this before, actually, uh, the woman clothed in the sun. Um, and in the apocalypse, um, there is a woman, and she gives birth to a child. So she's identified as Mary and, of course, the baby Jesus. And there is a seven-headed dragon with ten crowns whose tail sweeps the stars from the sky. As I say, it's visionary language. That isn't something you saw yesterday on campus. Um, and the dragon threatens the woman. He uh, pours, well, first the uh, child is taken up by an angel to heaven. And the dragon threatens the woman. He pours out water from his mouth, trying to drown the woman who is clothed in the sun. And you see rays of light coming from her with the crescent moon at her feet and the stars in her sky, and the stars in her crown. And you may remember that uh, in the Gant Aldebrecht, Jan van Eyck showed Mary with these stars in her crown. You know, she was the woman clothed in the sun. So the dragon is threatening her, he's trying to drown her, but she's given the wings of an eagle so she can fly away. There you see it again. So the imagery is very visual. When you say it, you know, you see pictures in your head. And of course, there's a long history uh, throughout the Middle Ages of in manuscripts, in tapestries, in wall paintings, uh, showing images of the apocalypse. And this goes right up to the present day. Um, if you uh, go to Bruges, uh, and uh, this uh, wonderful little uh, park uh, behind uh, the Church of Unserliebe Frau, and uh, before you get to the Grenoble Museum, um, there are sculptures from 1980s of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. We had an exhibition some years ago uh, in our local uh, uh, department gallery, and there were these wonderful linoleum cuts that someone had made of the, of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Um, you know, people still use this, these subjects as the basis of art. So they're very visual. But of course, as I said, that's not something you saw yesterday on campus that you could understand in, in you know, a rational, this is the way life always is sense. Uh, they're talking about the devastation of the end of the world or of supernatural events. Uh, it's conceived as an allegory. And of course, many people um, read the apocalypse and uh, you know, they try to put it in their present day. And I should say something about this. Uh, biblical scholars, um, you know, who are really scholars, um, generally agree, I believe, that the uh, Antichrist that is mentioned in the Apocalypse and some of the, you know, the, the, you know, the beast and uh, various um, not evil creatures that are talked about, the dragon, the beast, uh, the Antichrist, uh, are generally conceded, uh, considered to be uh, Nero, uh, who was uh, conducting a horrible persecution of Christians. Um, but people have taken uh, the, uh, uh, as I say, the allegorical figures and applied them to whoever they don't like in religion or politics. Uh, so during the Reformation, for example, uh, the Pope considered what? Uh, there, there's a woodcut of uh, Martin Luther as the seven-headed 
Luther, like the seven-headed dragon. Uh, and Luther, uh, you know, doubt, doubts the Pope as the Antichrist. And, uh, you know, you had this uh, vitriolic uh, identification uh, with these allegorical figures. Uh, I remember in the 20th century, uh, some people in America, when uh, there was a great rivalry and um, uh, animosity between uh, Soviet Russia, uh, some people say, oh, that's that's the great beast. This, this is the, uh, uh, you know, another country. Uh, and, you know, people, I'm sure they continue to do it. I mean, we've, I've done it with my friends with tongue-in-cheek uh, mentioning, for example, a politician that we didn't like, and we were joking about it. We did not, I must, I must say that we did not really mean that the person was the beast or the whore of Babylon or anything like that. It was tongue-in-cheek. Um, but you can see how these images continue with time. Now, that's one of the things I want to mention, time. When was this published? This was published in 1498. Now, how was it published? It was published as a book. It was the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, with illustrations. And so you would have on uh, one page the text, and on the facing page you would have the uh, image. Uh, the woodcut. It was a very timely publication because throughout history um, in the Christian world, many people try to decide when will the end of the world come and of course the apocalypse and then they believe followed by the last judgment. Um, in the year 1000, many people thought the year 1000, the, the millennium would be that year and we have this very um, interesting quotation where uh, someone says that they went out and uh, built churches right after the year 1000. And he's writing in uh, uh, 1003. And he says that the whole world was clothed in the white mantle of the churches because, you know, they're building them because they're so grateful that God did not put an end to the world in the year 1000. Well, it's what you might call millennium fever. Uh, at the millennium, or the half millennium, uh, many people claim that that is when the end of the world will will end. You know, with uh, what the current dating system. Um, I always thought that was a little strange. The Bible says that no man knows the hour, but I guess a lot of people think they know the year. Uh, and you may remember that uh, around the year two thousand. Uh, besides people worried that their computers were going to crash, uh, there were also people who were preaching that the end of the world was going to come. Well, many people thought that the world would end at the half millennium of 1500, 1,500 years since when they believed the birth of Christ was. Um, and so this was timely. You know, this was something people were interested in, that preachers were preaching. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you could both uh, purchase the apocalypse and read all about it, uh, and you could also have these uh, wonderful images, you know, as a, a print collector, uh, you'd have this as well. Uh, today, a lot of these prints, because of course it was published uh, as multiples, have been taken out of the book, you know, and they've been cut out so that presumably dealers or someone could uh, sell more, or maybe it was cut out earlier so that someone could just have a single leaf. Um, but uh, Dewar was a very good businessman. You know. He was very interested in the sale of his work, and he had people uh, who were salesmen in different territories, and they'd go out and, and sell his prints. Now, what does this mean? The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. As I said, um, in the Apocalypse there is a book with seven seals. And each time the lamb, a symbolic of Christ presumably, breaks one of the seals, horrible devastation is rained out all over the world. So when one of the seals is broken, the four horsemen of the apocalypse ride forth, uh, killing people. You know, they ride down, they kill people from all walks of life. And you can see that here. You know, they're just trampling over uh, all these uh, people down in the lower right. The four horsemen have been in, in you know, Christian exegesis or Christian commentary um, interpreted 
uh, as various things that bring death. Now, if you go back clear back to the ninth century, to the Carolingian period, you'll find that sometimes the man with the bow and arrow, the man on the white horse, was identified with Christ. But by this time, he was usually identified as plague, the bringer of pestilence. Um, and some of you who know classical um, iconography, you may know the uh, story or classical mythology, you may know the story of um, Apollo and Artemis shooting arrows at the children of uh, Niobe uh, and um, killing them, uh, presumably with plague. Um, so that has what a, a kind of long history uh, of the idea of associating of the the archer uh, with uh, the bringer of plague. And of course, many of these are uh, suggested in the text as well. Uh, the man on the red horse wields a sword. He is war. The man on the black horse carries a balance. And if you read the text, you know, it does sound like, you know, someone who is, uh, what, profiting, profiting from, the bal uh, from famine. You'll notice that this fellow is, uh, you know, he's a little bit of stomach here. He's a little uh, heavier. Uh, and uh, when I think of this, I usually think of someone who is hoarding the grain in time of famine and, you know, weighing it out in minuscule amounts and charging great amounts of money for it. I don't know if that's really what everybody else thinks, uh, but we do have that uh, association with famine, with the man on the black horse. It, of course, it isn't quite shown here as black, but um, and holding a balance or a scale. Then the Bible says, and death on a pale horse, and hell follows after. And you see here in the uh, lower left, this skeletal horse, pale horse, and uh, this sort of mummified figure. You can really see the bones, flesh and bones, you know, just, uh, just skin and bones uh, figure of death. And he's riding forth. And of course, that image of death on a pale horse, um, you know, has given rise to literary and artistic uh, images. There are other images of what, just death on a pale horse, um, rider for one. Uh, also, you may know that there is an Agatha Christie murder mystery that's called Death on a Pale Horse. Um, and so, you know, this is a biblical reference uh, that's uh, very familiar. And then he says, hell follows after. If you look in the lower left, there's this big monster mouth. It seems to be swallowing up a bishop. <laughs> Um, and this is how uh, the entrance to hell was often portrayed in medieval art, is what we call a hell mouth, this giant monster mouth. So hell is following after, uh, is sort of uh, swallowing up the people as the four horsemen ride them down and, and kill them. We see here that uh, this is a detail, and we can see the uh, monogram of Dur, and you can see these uh, people you know, who have been, uh, who are being ridden down. Um, I've taken a detail, and so we've cropped out the bishop who was being swallowed up by the hell mouth. Uh, but you see people in all different locks of life. Uh, you see the rich, presumably rich fat burger. We see perhaps the housefrau. Uh, we see a man, uh, we see his tonsor, so he's undoubtedly a monk. Uh, you know, just ordinary people, uh, but different different social scales, you know, someone who may be poorer. Uh, and we mentioned the bishop, you know, who is, who is swallowed up by hell. Um, one of the motifs, of course, that comes through from the Middle Ages is the idea that only in death, you know, are people somewhat equalized. Everybody has to die. Uh, and so this is just killing everybody. You know, you can't say, I'm the pope, you can't kill me, or I'm the king, you can't kill me. You know, this, everyone is dying. And you can also see that just using the black lines uh, of the you know, woodcut, uh, he's showing you different textures, uh, the textures of uh, uh, what d different uh, mane, the mane of the horse and, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, hair. Um, I should bring up the other one. You've got an angel with the, with the feathers of the wing and the clouds. Uh, so there's all sorts of detailed textures uh, within uh, the uh, woodcut. Now, I want to put that in a little bit of historical context because one of the things that Albrecht Dewar does is make the woodcut into fine art. 
woodcuts had been cheap, crude, commercial images. And I have to admit, I have a taste for these uh, very early woodcuts. Uh, and they are sort of uh, sometimes rude and crude, as I call them. Um, some people talk about high art and low art. You know, they're reproductions, but they're not um, they're the highest quality. Uh, and here you see, uh, from about 20 years before, uh, a woodcut which was used in the Cologne Bible of 1478 and 79, I think it was also reused in other uh, Bibles, uh, showing the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And you might notice iconographically they have a lot in common. Uh, the four horsemen are all there. Uh, you have the people who are, you know, dying and uh, the hellmouth down in the same place, the lower uh, left, uh, swallowing them up, uh, threatening them. Uh, you have a few changes. There's two angels in the Cologne Bible. As you see, it's horizontal and they're what, maybe filling up some space in the sky. Uh, only one angel endures vertical image, uh, sort of page, uh, full page image. Uh, You've got a devil uh, you know, whipping people, uh, but uh, that's in the Cologne Bible, and Dewar does not use that image. But you know, iconographically, there are quite a lot of similarities. But stylistically, they are so different. There is death on a pale horse, and I blew up this image so you could see the shading. You'll remember how you make a woodcut. The artist will do a drawing. It would be glued to the block of wood. And then the cutter would cut away everything but the lines of the drawing. Now, you can understand why early woodcuts are often uh, just line drawings, maybe a little bit. Uh, the earliest ones do not have any shading, and then, uh, you know, as they progress, they have just a little bit of shading with what is known as hatching, which is essentially parallel lines. Because if you were to make your line just tiny, 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 uh, when you carve it, it would just break off. You can't print from a splinter. You know, it has to have a wider base. Uh, And Dewar does something that you're not supposed to be able to do with woodcuts. Uh, not only does he use uh, hatching uh, and sometimes very uh, lines that are very, very close together and sometimes much further apart to give a sense of different uh, half tones or shades of gray. Um, and he often uses those hatched lines as they uh, follow the shape of the body or the drapery or, you know, whatever it is he's uh, showing. But he also has the appearance of cross-hatching. Now, think about cutting this. Uh, if you were to cut a line one way and then cut the lines the other way, they'd just break off. You can't really do what is cross-hatching in a drawing in a woodcut because it has to be cut out of that block of wood. And so I was fascinated when I got this uh, really good reproduction and you could blow it up and, and really look at these um, bits. And I realized how he was doing, or what, what the cutter was doing, uh, was they were taking a gouge and you know following a line. And it's, it's even fascinating to me because it's not a purely straight line. It gives you the feeling of um, the uh, fabric, you know, uh, having some depth and uh, you know, curving inward and, and maybe a little bit outward in certain places. But anyway, in parallel lines, he's taken the gouge and just sort of nicked out uh, a little bit of the wood. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's masterful. Now, who carved the wood? Well, we don't know. Erwin um, Panofsky wrote a book on Albrecht Dürer it's one of the you know, classic books on Dewar. Um, and in it, he says that when Dewar first started uh, doing these very detailed prints, you know, there wasn't anybody who knew how to carve like that. 
And he suggests that Dewar may have carved his earliest prints and then, of course, undoubtedly had to train people and get really good wood carvers to be able to uh, you know, follow through and uh, uh, do the kind of detailed cutting that he needed. Uh, so he actually spe speculates that Dewar may have cut some of his own woodcuts. Uh, but he didn't give a footnote. He didn't tell me where he got his source. So one time when I was at a conference, um, Jane Hutchinson was there, who has written a book, uh, a biography of Albrecht Dewar, which has lots of information and, and wonderful footnotes uh, about where you can get information about his artwork. It's not just a biography. It's also an art historical um, uh, study of, of Dewar. Um, and uh, I, I went to her and I asked her the question. I said, well, what's the source for that? Where did he get it? She said, he made it up. So it just seemed logical to him, but we do not have any documentation. Um, I feel quite certain that uh, we know at later times, you know, we know Dewar had wood cutters cutting. I doubt that he did the manual labor of cutting, but I'm quite certain that he required the highest quality of craftsmanship. You know, if, if you weren't creating uh, this kind of incredibly detailed uh, uh, reproduction of Dewar's drawing, then, you know, you're not going to you're not going to keep your job, <laughs> essentially. And of course, if you think about German woodcutting oh, in sculpture, they have the most wonderful woodcutters. Um, so probably Dewar did not actually cut it, but he created something of a higher quality in the drawings and then undoubtedly insisted on the highest quality in reproducing those drawings. Okay, let's look at an engraving by Dewar. This is the engraving known as Adam and Eve, because that's what you see, Adam and Eve. Uh, the uh, partaking of the forbidden fruit. First, accept Eve is accepting the uh, forbidden fruit from the serpent. And, you know, once again, we have uh, Albrecht Dewar, in this case, uh, writing his name uh, and have a Latin inscription up here in this placard uh, in the upper left that's hanging from the branch of the tree. It gives us the date. It tells us, you know, that uh, Albrecht Dewar of Nuremberg made this. Uh, now, I want to talk to you about some of the characteristics of engraving. We've talked about this before. Uh, that engraving allows more detail than woodcut. Um, and it's, you know, it's very simple. With uh, engraving, your lines of the uh, printed, of the print, uh, are created by taking a tool called a burin and incising lines in a metal plate, usually a copper plate at this time. Uh, and obviously, you know, the metal's not going to break off uh, it's the line that can be very, very fine because it's being carved in metal. Woodcuts, of course, are a relief print, which you're printing the raised surface. Engraving is what we call an intaglio print, where the ink is pressed down into the incised lines, into the grooves. And then the surface of the plate is wiped. And then using a printing press that can literally push the paper down into those grooves um, with very high pressure, um, you know, you create your engraving. So more detail is possible with engraving than with woodcut. And uh, to illustrate that, I uh, found this in a book where they had two details of the serpent from uh, the uh, original sin, fall of man, Adam and Eve, uh, prints by Albrecht Dewar, and they reproduced them at the same same scale, you know, like if it was an inch in the, each print. And now, of course, we're blowing it up. Uh, but you can see that although there's a, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, intricate carving uh, with the woodcut, which of course is the lower image, uh, you can certainly get much more detail, much more shading, uh, and much finer lines with an engraving, which is part of the medium. So back to Adam and Eve from 1504. 
uh, when we look at this, you can see all of those uh, detailed naturalism, uh, all the textures that are created, the bark of the tree, the flesh of the human beings, uh, the different types of fur on the different animals, and of course the feathers of the, the parrot up above. Uh, the leaves, the rocks in the background and uh, the ground, you know, just all of these very uh, well observed and reproduced textures. You know, how does light shine on different surfaces to reveal the texture uh, and how can we translate that into black line essentially? Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about this. Uh, you know, of course, the story uh, from Genesis that uh, the serpent, who is uh, Satan, uh, speaks to Eve and tells her that uh, she should eat from the forbidden fruit, uh, the forbidden fruit, the uh, fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And God has said to the first human beings, Adam and Eve, that you have all of this beautiful garden, Garden of Eden, and you can eat from any tree you want, but not this tree. This is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So they are totally naive beings. They do not know good or evil until the serpent says to Eve, you should eat this. And she believes him. I mean, he's the father of lies. She's totally naive. Uh, and uh, she takes the fruit and eats it. And then she offers it to Adam. So we're seeing here that moment when she's first accepting the fruit. Now, you'll notice that there's all these different animals. Uh, there's a parrot up above. I'll talk to you about him a minute. And there's four different uh, furry animals, uh, four-legged animals, uh, down uh, uh, on the ground in front and uh, behind Adam and Eve. Uh, the parrot, uh, there's certainly different ideas about the parrot. Um, parrots are not native to Germany. <laughs> uh, they are essentially paradisial birds that have been brought from warmer climates. And of course, they're very colorful. Uh, so there's maybe this idea of the parrot who is uh, this exotic bird uh, living in uh, the Garden of Eden which in this case looks a little bit like the Schwarzer Wald to the, the black forest of uh, Germany uh, with the various uh, uh, northern uh, tree forms. Uh, so this may help to identify it as the earthly paradise. Uh, it also, there is also another idea about uh, parrots. Um, their squawk, their sound was sometimes in the Middle Ages interpreted as Ave! Ave! In other words, the angelic salutation of Ave, gratia plena. Hail, Mary, thou art full of grace. Um, and associated with the Annunciation. Now, what does that have to do with the fall of man? Well, the Annunciation, as we've said before, was the moment of the Incarnation, when, um, according to Christian belief, uh, God became man and redeemed the sin of Adam. And in fact, uh, in um, the New Testament, you know, St. Paul talks about Christ as uh, the new Adam who redeems the sin of the old Adam, the original Adam, who we see here. Now, are those animals just, you know, showing you that there were lots of animals in the world? Or do they have another meaning? Uh, Panofsky identified them as animals representing the four humors or the four temperaments. Um, and you know, we've heard about this when I talked to you about uh, Hieronymus Bosch. It was believed that when man uh, first disobeyed God and took and ate the uh, forbidden fruit, they had knowledge then of good and evil, uh, that this brought sin, death, and disease into the world. Uh, the medieval theory of disease was that um, everybody had these four humors. You can kind of think of them as hormones, if you will, and they do relate to uh, I guess certain uh, liquids and semi-solids within the body, <laughs> uh, to different parts of the body. Um, and these were thrown out of whack. <laughs> Uh, originally, they were perfectly balanced. Mankind had no disease. Mankind had no death. But with the fall of man, uh, the temperaments are out of order. Uh, 
Uh, somebody's got too much black bile. Someone else has too much yellow bile. Someone else has too much phlegm. Someone else is governed by uh, blood. Uh, there's different uh, parts of uh, the body. Um, so it's sin bought the imbalance of these humors, uh, disease and death followed. And uh, Panofsky suggested that the different animals were symbolic of the four humors. The oak, the oak, excuse me, the elk, uh, he identified with melancholy. A uh, melancholy is, we would call it depression today, perhaps, uh, but melancholy is when you feel very, very sad, and it's caused by having, they believed it's caused by, it was, they believed that it was caused by having too much black bile. Uh, cats, you know, which pounce on their prey, are often considered to be choleric. Choler is too much yellow bile. It's when you get angry, you have a bad temper. Except you might notice something here. That is the least choleric cat, you know, anybody's ever seen. It's just snoozing there, and there's a little mouse right in front of it. Why isn't it pouncing on the mouse? Um, in Hieronymus Bosch, picture of the Garden of, Earth, of Earthly Delights, the uh, Eden panel, uh, the cat has caught a mouse or a rat. Well, there were two ideas about how the fall of man uh, affected animals. Neither one was doctrine. You, know, you could believe what you wanted. Uh, one idea was that, you know, the animals were always the way they were. You know, if a cat preyed on a mouse, it preyed on a mouse. That was just the way it was set up. Um, the other idea was that animals lived in perfect peace and harmony until human beings sinned. And that sin affected the animals and they you know, did start to prey on each other. And that seems to be what Dewar is suggesting here, because as I said, there is the, the, the cat is certainly not pouncing on the, the mouse at this point. Um, the bovine, the cow or cattle in the background, uh, maybe it's an ox, a little hard to tell, uh, either a cow or an ox, uh, is phlegmatic. Yeah. Too much phlegm, it makes you what, slothful, uh, tired all the time. And then the rabbit is sanguine. Of the four humors, sanguine, which you can see from the name, has to do with blood, um, was supposed to be the best of these four humors that you could have. It made you kind of hail fellow well met. Um, you know, it didn't have some of the um, detriments of being melancholy or choleric or phlegmatic. Um, on the other hand, being sanguine about things, you know, not, not worrying, could have bad repercussions in the hereafter because you might not uh, pay enough attention to your immortal soul. You know, you might not be serious enough. Uh, and uh, the rabbit, who uh, is uh, what uh, often engaged in sex and has lots of little rabbits, uh, and this, of course, was something that you know uh, people who are sanguine enjoy the pleasures of the flesh, uh, you know, might represent them. So uh, those ideas have been uh, suggested and, and pretty widely uh, accepted and repeated. Now here is a point that I want you to know. I often ask this on exams and I see people missing it and I, I can't really understand because I'm not only going to discuss the idea of ideal proportions in Albrecht Dewar, but I'm going to you know, give you a visual example here. So we said that Dewar was very interested in the ideal proportions of the human being. In fact, Dewar was so interested in proportion and in perspective that he wrote books on them and you know, illustrated them. So yes, he really was interested in ideal proportions. He really was interested in linear perspective uh, and foreshortening and all of these uh, sort of mathematical constructs of the Renaissance. And what I'm showing you here is how the figures of Adam and Eve relate to the perfect proportions of classical antiquity. Um, 
The sculpture that you see here is the Apollo Belvedere. Uh, it was discovered in the late, uh, the late 14th century. Uh, and when it was discovered, it was believed by uh, the Renaissance people to say, oh, this is the epitome of manly beauty. The perfect proportions, of course, it's set up in the Belvedere in the uh, Vatican. There were many drawings and engravings made. And so even as far as I know, Dürer didn't get down as far as Rome. Uh, he went to northern Italy, uh, to Venice. Uh, but he may well have seen engravings, he may well have seen uh, drawings of this uh, very, very famous statue. Now, with the wonders of digitalization, I uh, reversed, I flipped horizontally the Apollo Belvedere, so it would be in the uh, same way as uh, Dewar's Adam. So you could see very clearly that this is a kind of model for his Adam, the perfect proportions, and even the pose. Um, Adam, of course, has all his arms, uh, and uh, one of the arms is, is turned up a little bit around the branch, a little bit more, and the other arm extends out, perhaps, at a greater angle, uh, but, uh, and the head, of course, is turned to face Eve, turned the other way. Um, but you could almost imagine someone, um, you know, drawing uh, from uh, the, the Apollo Belvedere, or uh, drawing after it, uh, and then, when it's printed, of course, it flips it. So, you know, we see this in reverse. Uh, but Adam is in a very clearly the ideal proportions uh, as arranged by classical antiquity. Now, I think when a lot of people today would look at Eve, that wouldn't be the first thing they'd think of. They'd see she has a little double chin, uh, the flesh looks quite soft. Uh, you know, they'd think of her more as a, a kind of what, to, and forgive me for saying this, but you know, a kind of housefrau. Um, not a classical Venus. But when you put a classical Venus, and here we have the uh, Medici Venus, which is uh, today in, uh, in the Uffizi Gallery, uh, this was a very well-known classical statue, and once again, drawings and, and prints were made of it, um, and uh, you know, as I say, very well-known. Uh, when you put that right next to Eve, you see, oh my goodness, the arms aren't in the same position, but the proportions are the same. And indeed, I, you know, when you take the photograph from the particular angle we have here, uh, the the pose of the lower of the legs, uh, and what even the profile uh, is, you know, it's, it's very very close to uh, the Medici Venus. So what has Dewar done? I said he used the best of both worlds. You know, he used the classical proportions that were uh, so uh, beloved and uh, studied in uh, Italy, and then the detailed surface textures of you know that we we associate with uh, northern artists. So we have you know different furs. We have the bark of the tree. We have the hair, and even the sort of softness of the human flesh. Whereas uh, Dewar. Excuse me, whereas Dewar has shown, you know, Adam with the, all of these, you know, very uh, uh, delineated, very hard muscles. You know, he's really showing you, hey, I understand the musculature of the human body. And then uh, women who actually naturally do have an extra layer of fat. Uh, you're not seeing, you know, every single muscle. It's a little softer, uh, although you do see a certain uh, muscular st structure there. So, Northern Naturalistic Details, Italian Ideal Proportions. And please do remember that for the exam. What about Dewar's reputation in his own day? As I said, you know, if he got to Italy and the humanist circles, he was lauded as a genius. And uh, so I think this is uh, very appropriate to show you Erasmus of Rotterdam compared Dewar to Apelles. And I remind you who Apelles was. Apelles was the painter to Alexander the Great, 4th century BCE. There are you know, many stories of the friendship of, uh, of uh, Alexander and Apelles. And this, these stories were well known <laughs> in the Renaissance courts. And by Renaissance, of course, Renaissance humanism, humanists would be the ones who uh, promulgated them. 
there were no paintings by Apelles. The only thing that has survived and that had survived in the Renaissance were literary descriptions. But it was believed that Apelles was the greatest artist who had ever lived. And during the Renaissance, artists sometimes painted the same subjects as Apelles did. You'll remember uh, uh, Botticelli paints the birth of Venus, and he also, you didn't see this in this class, but he also paints the calamity of Apelles, um, a work that is described in some detail by Lucian and painted according to that description uh, by Botticelli. And, uh, and it's also engraving uh, by Montaigne of that subject. Um, Titian paints a um, birth of Venus that follows the description of Apelli's birth of Venus, where she's squeezing the water out of her hair. She's twisting her hair and squeezing the water and rising from the, the sea. Um, you'll remember that um, you know, Giorgione painted lightning, and this would be compared to uh, Apelli's, who had you know, painted lightning in ancient times, painted that which cannot be painted. And you already see that uh, motif appearing again. Pelles was supposed to have done it, Giorgione was supposed to have done it, and as we'll see, Dürer was supposed to have done it. Painted that which cannot be painted. Or in Dürer's case, he was doing, he was drawing and having a print rather than uh, using paint and color. Who is Erasmus of Rotterdam? He's a humanist scholar and a Christian reformer. And he compares Dürer to Apelles, but he says Dewar is superior. Dewar is greater than the greatest artist that ever lived because Apelles needed color to do what Dewar could do solely with black line. Okay, a little bit on Erasmus of Rotterdam, very, very famous Christian uh, reformer and humanist scholar. And I'm showing you uh, two portraits of him. Up in the corner, we have an engraving by Dewar. And down below, we have one of uh, several uh, portraits of Erasmus of Rotterdam by Hans Holbein. Uh, he, Erasmus preferred Holbein's paintings to Dewar's engravings, uh, we might say. Um, and Erasmus was very well known. Um, I said he was a reformer. Uh, he pointed out some of the abuses in the Catholic Church, but he did not leave the Catholic Church uh, at the time of the Reformation. Um, he remained faithful to the Church, and but as I said, he was a reformer because he was calling for reform of the Church without breaking it up. Uh, at one point he says, I'm willing to be a martyr for Christ, but I will not be a martyr for Luther. Uh, today he may be best known for works like In Praise of Folly, uh, he also uh, did a, a treatise called the Handbook of the Christian Soldier, uh, which uh, in which uh, you know the virtues are likened to um, no to you know various parts of the the soldier's army armor, uh, and of course one of the great contributions that he made to scholarship was his edition of the Greek New Testament. So here we see him, you know, as a scholar writing, and now is a translation. Uh, and of course, uh, some words could be translated various ways, but uh, uh, excerpts uh, from the uh, comments that Erasmus makes about Dewar, and this gives you an idea of how Dewar was received uh, in the 16th century. He says that Apelles was assisted by color, but Dewar, what does not he not, but Dewar. What does he not express in black lines? He observes accurately proportions and harmonies. He even depicts that which cannot be depicted. Fire, rays of light, thunder, lightning, clouds on a wall, or possibly dreams or visions is what it's a, a saying. Uh, so, Here's that things that cannot be depicted. In other words, things that won't hold still <laughs> to be uh, measured and observed. Uh, fire, rays of light, thunder, lightning. No, intangibles. Things that are there one moment, gone the next. Uh, clouds on the wall is a kind of uh, 
slang, maybe a little a way of saying, uh, you know, things that are not tangible, uh, dreams, visions. All the sensations and emotions. In fine, the whole mind of man as it reflects itself in the behavior of the body and almost the voice itself. All this he does with such singular felicity by black line alone that if color were added, it would only detract. Which, of course, extremely high praise. Um, the problem for Dewar was that so many people thought of him as uh, the Apelles of Black Line, which is actually uh, how Panofsky entitles a chapter in his book. And he calls Dewar the Apelles of Black Line. Um, Dewar also wanted people to recognize that he, he could use color, he did use color in his paintings. Um, and we'll be seeing something shortly with color in it. So he's perfectly capable and perfectly masterful using color as well. But it also shows you that many people had never seen a painting by Dewar. They had only seen the prints with black line. Now, I said something about Erasmus being a reformer. What was I talking about? I was talking about the Protestant Reformation. And of course, the events, um, well, let's define the Protestant Reformation. And I'll tell you where I got this definition. I made a, little a few little changes in the wording. Uh, for example, numerous denominations, that's I think, my wording. Uh, but uh, it comes from a book uh, called the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church, which is a very handy reference uh, for you know, looking up uh, various definitions and uh, events uh, that uh, occurred during you know, uh, periods of Christianity in uh, Western Europe and other Christian areas. Um, and so this is, as I say, it's, it's uh, close to, I've made a few changes, but to their definition. The Protestant Reformation was a series of religious events that resulted in the split in Western Christianity between the Roman Catholic Church and the numerous denominations founded in protest against the doctrines, policies, and institutions of Catholicism. Now, we said the split in Western Christianity because the Christian Church was already split between the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church, and the Western Church, what we today call the Roman Catholic Church. You know, every once in a while, I'll, come, I'll have a student come up to me and say, uh, I think, I, not very frequently, but you know, I've had a student come up to me one time and say, well, how come you're only teaching Catholic art when we're talking about uh, the early Renaissance or the Italian Renaissance? Um, and, you know, it's 15th, I'm talking about the 15th century, and I say to them, well, how many Protestants were there in the 15th century? And they look at me and say, oh, well, I don't know. And the problem is that they need to realize that Protestantism came into being at a certain time and place. Now, and with our wonderful hindsight, we look back at other events that occurred earlier, and some people will consider those part of the Reformation. Uh, and other people, uh, you know, may consider the beginning of the Reformation the part that led to a lasting split in Western Christianity. So, among these events was the sale of indulgences to finance the building of new St. Peter's in Rome. Now, the Church of St. Peter's, we talked about this with Bramante, uh, the, the Church of St. Peter's, uh, the old St. Peter's, was a fourth century basilica church, and for centuries it was the largest church in Christendom. Uh, by the 15th century and the early 16th century, uh, it was getting dilapidated, I gather. Uh, and so Pope Julius II decided that they should build a new Church of St. Peter's. 
and they tore down the old one and they did this in pieces. They didn't tear the whole church down and then build the whole church up because it took a lot of time. So they do it piece by piece. Um, they built this huge new church, which is now the largest church in the Christian world uh, of uh, St. Peter's, Santa Pietro, Ad Vaticano, St. Peter's in the Vatican. And uh, we, we talked about that with the different uh, plans and uh, designs by Bramante, Michelangelo, and then the 17th century one, of course, uh, by Moderna, that uh, comes a little bit later than our period here. But this is the period in which they're, they're tearing down the old St. Peter's, they're starting to build the new St. Peter's, and they need money. Well, how can you get that? And think about any church, whether it's Protestant or Catholic, if they need to finance a building campaign, they need to raise money, you know, bake sales, donations, however they do it. Well, the Pope had an idea. How could he get people to pay money that would then help support the building of the church? Now, the popes for a long time had claimed uh, that the, the biblical source is uh, Christ saying to Peter, um, Peter, you are my rock. You, the name Peter means, uh, is in, in Latin, would be uh, stone. You know, rock is very, very similar to the word for stone. Um, Pietro's Pietro. Um, you, know, you are the rock upon which I will build my church. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And this, of course, is where the popes, the, for the bishops of Rome, which was, uh, Peter was the first bishop of Rome, uh, claim uh, their papal authority. And one of the things they believed that they could do was, that the church could do, uh, was absolve sin. Um, generally, uh, you know, the priest would be the only one who could absolve sin, and people would confess, and they would be given a penance, something, uh, you know, to make up for the sin, to punish them a little bit. Uh, and then, you know, if they were sincerely sorry and intended not to sin again, they were forgiven. There was another way that you could, there were other ways that you could get um, your sins forgiven. Uh, one of them was called an indulgence. And the definition I have of indulgence comes from the uh, ODCC, the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church. Uh, what is an indulgence? It's a remission of temporal penalty for forgiven sin. What's that mean? It means that you're not, your sin has been forgiven, so you're not going to be punished in real time for that. What does it mean to the average person who doesn't go around you know, repeating the theological definition? It means less time in purgatory. Now, you can get indulgences various ways. Um, the popes would declare that certain acts done with a proper state of mind, you know, attitude, uh, would earn you time off from purgatory. So for example, uh, Roger van der Weyden, I remember, uh, went down to Rome in the Jubilee year of 1450. Now, making that pilgrimage to Rome and uh, saying certain prayers at certain churches, were intended to earn indulgences for people. Why? Why? Well, you know, the Pope has the authority was the idea, but also, you know, essentially, they were good deeds. Or in some cases, they were, um, you know, a little bit of punishment. It's very dangerous to travel long distances, for example. Uh, and sometimes it's very hard. Uh, but... Uh, you know, you're doing this extra special thing. You're going on pilgrimage. Uh, you're, well, sometimes you'll be viewing relics and, uh, you know, thinking about the saints and uh, saying pr prayers. Um, you know, you might uh, climb the sacred stairs on your knees. 
Uh, there's a lot of different things that were believed to give indulgences. Uh, sometimes spiritual pilgrimages were believed, uh, not always uh, authorized by the Pope. People did sometimes claim indulgences beyond what the Pope had said. Um, there's a you know, there's some books where they'll say, you know, if you say these prayers, you do these things, you, do, you get, say, 30,000 years off of purgatory. Originally, the time wasn't specified. You just knew that, you know, you were going to be forgiven and uh, you wouldn't have to stay in purgatory till those sins were burned away. Um, later on, in the later Middle Ages, uh, the number of years off were often cited. You know, you do this activity and you get this many years off from purgatory. I think that has to do with the rise of capitalism. Uh, you know, people want to know, you know, with capitalism, am I getting my money's worth? Uh, you know, what am I paying? What am I getting out of it? And I think that attitude uh, goes uh, toward indulgences. You know, like, okay, you're telling me I'm getting some time off of purgatory. How long am I getting? You know, am I getting 30,000 years, 5,000 years? Uh, or am I getting uh, uh, all of it off? Uh, plenary indulgence. Uh, you know, all the sins I've committed so far, you know, aren't going to count against me because I have been forgiven. Well, how could this make money to finance New St. Peter's? Well, financing New St. Peter's is a good deed. So if you help finance it, you know, maybe you should get some time off of purgatory. So the... Uh, the church sent out salesmen to sell indulgences. And the pictures that we have of these is, you know, they look like a little contract, a piece of paper with seals hanging from them. <laughs> and um, so they would go and uh, they would preach. And there was a particularly famous preacher uh, named uh, uh, Tetzel who went uh, to Germany and uh, was uh, preaching uh, and uh, racking up great sales in indulgences. And, you know, he would, he would uh, uh, describe the pains of purgatory. Purgatory uh, is like hell, but it's not necessarily permanent. It's not forever. Once your sins are punished enough, you can go to heaven. You know, all of your sins are burned away, as it were. Uh, but it's, it, except for limbo, which is the outer reaches and there's no pain, and that's just for good people uh, who were never baptized, were never Christian is the idea. But those people who are, you know, have to get their sins burned away uh, so they can get into heaven uh, could go to purgatory. Uh, presumably, it's much better than, okay, you have too many sins, you go straight to hell. Well, you know, uh, some people, that was supposedly had happened. Um, and then most people supposedly had to spend some time in purgatory. But who wanted to? It's horrible, painful. Um, and it was also believed that you could buy indulgences for people who had already passed. So, you know, Tetzel would say, you know, who would be so cruel as to leave their father or their mother in purgatory when all you have to do is, you know, purchase an indulgence and they'll get out of purgatory. He had a little advertising jingle. Now, this is the English translation. Um, it's a little bit more onomatopoeic in German, but uh, when a coin in the coffer ring, uh, rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Clanks might be more the, the sound, but anyway. Uh, so, you know, when a soul, uh, when you put the money in the coffer and the coin rings, then your father or whoever, you know, springs out of purgatory. Now, a lot of people read about that and they say, well, this isn't fair. If you're rich, you can get out of purgatory, but if you're poor, you can't. Actually, it, wasn't worked that, it didn't work that way. There was a sliding scale. For the same plenary indulgence, a very, very poor person would pay a very, very small amount. But a nobleman or a rich merchant, you know, who was uh, much more well-heeled would have to pay a very large amount. And that way, you know, everybody could get the indulgence. Um, you know, nobody was cut off was the idea, uh, but you made a lot of money from those rich guys. Uh, not all of the indulgences went straight to Rome. Uh, some of them uh, went to uh, local officials, uh, such as Cardinal Brandenburg, the uh, uh, he had been the Archbishop of Mainz, and he was an elector of Saxony, and he had to pay 
to become a cardinal. And uh, the, the uh, bribes, and this is what they were, were these huge bribes, uh, which we call simonry, the selling of offices. Uh, you know, the, the, how is he going to make that money back? Well, he got a kickback off the indulgences that were sold in his territory. Okay, what's all this got to do with Dewar? Well, we're going to get to that. Uh, first, we're going to talk about this Martin Luther guy. And this is the point that I see as the event that just, I guess we could say, snowballs and uh, leads to a permanent split in Western Christendom. Against these indulgences, Martin Luther wrote 95 theses. They're all against indulgences. They're not against other things. Uh, And they've been translated. They're on the web if you want to read them. Uh, I didn't get through them all. I thought, gee, these are repetitious, I must admit. (laughs) But he wrote, you know, you would say 95 objections to uh, these indulgences. And he took the piece of paper in which he wrote these and nailed them to the doors of Wittenberg Church on October 31st, 1517, which is, I consider that Reformation Day. I don't know if anybody else does or not. Uh, But it's sort of a point in history that we can say, on this day, this happened, and then we can see what happened afterwards. Um, Now, why did he do that? Who was this Martin Luther guy? Um, Martin Luther was a college professor. He was the professor of theology at Wittenberg University. And besides teaching his classes, one of his jobs was to give public presentations on various theological matters. And, you know, when they were going to do this, they would post what they were going to talk about on the door of the church and just nail it up like a bulletin board. Uh, You know, and then you can come and hear him speak. So this was... This is what he was going to speak on. Um, Actually, in the territory uh, of Saxony, um, Frederick the Wise was the ruler, and he did not let the um, indulgent sellers come in, probably for various reasons. Uh, One of them was that he had a big moneymaker with uh, people, I think it was once a year, you know, he would open up his huge relic collection and people would pay to come in and see the relics and get indulgences. Um, And so it was competition. Uh, But also it was something that he was not controlling. These were foreigners, you know, coming in. And, um, but Martin Luther heard about it and he was horrified. Uh, He felt that it was a very, very, very bad theological precedent um, and that people were believing that they, even if it was technically they were purchasing the indulgence, which was a good deed, you know, we could build the church, you know, all this, uh, and so they were being, um, you know, they'd give the times all purgatory because they did a good deed. Uh, Most people were thinking they were just buying salvation. I mean... A lot of people weren't making all of those little distinctions that I I tried to make to try to understand this. Um, They just thought they were buying salvation, and he was horrified. He thought it would lead people to sin, um, you know, and and maybe you know some of these people would be deceived and uh, you know would go to hell because of it. He was he was very upset about this. Okay, so who is he? Well, he became an Augustinian friar. Um, when he was out in a horrible thunderstorm and uh, he thought he was going to be struck by lightning and killed and he prayed to Saint Anne. He said, Saint Anne, if you you know, spare my life, uh, I will become a monk. And what he became actually was an Augustinian friar from the uh, Augustinian hermits. Um, but he was personally, he, he just didn't think he was good enough to be saved. You know, this was a great worry for him. Um, and his conf- and he would do all the things they were supposed to do. You know, he would, um, as a, he, he would lie flat for hours and hours and hours in front of the crucifix, or he would fast, um, presumably mortified the flesh as well. Um, and yet, you know, he still, you know, am I saved? Am I, you know, or am I going to go to hell? Uh, very concerned about this, naturally, I guess. Um, yeah, maybe a lot of... Uh, what they sometimes call scrupulosity, you know, feeling of guilt, 
uh, for even minor matters. Uh, and uh, his confessor thought, well, a good antidote to this would be uh, to let him know some more theology. So he, you know, he essentially sent him to the university, uh, and uh, you know, he studied theology. He eventually received his doctorate in theology, and uh, then he became a professor at Wittenberg University. He is also known as the founder of the German Reformation. And lest you think that that's just German, um, the repercussions of this led to the Reformation in other countries as well. Now, I'm showing you this one picture of Martin Luther. You may have seen many, many pictures of Martin Luther. Um, they're most of them, I, was, I want to say all, but you know, you're never supposed to say all, uh, but most of them are based on drawings and paintings by Lucas Cronick the Elder. He was a friend of Martin Luther and a court painter to the Elector of Saxony, to Frederick the Wise. Um, and this, I think, is, you know, this wonderful drawing, which seems to have been a drawing from life on which he based many of these paintings. So what did Martin Luther do besides the 95 Theses uh, against indulgences? He translated the Latin Bible into German. Now, I always thought that he was the first to do that, and then I started doing my research for a Reformation art class, and I found out that there had been a, a, a number of previous translations from Latin into German. But what was said was most of those, you almost had to know Latin. They were very literal translations. I, uh, some of you may have uh, tried the translator programs, um, you know, Google or uh, some of the other ones uh, in the, uh, on the web. And some of the translations are just really strange because the word, the uh, program is just looking up words, and it may even have you know improper grammatical content, and sometimes it will translate uh, proper names. Um, so it really helps if you know, for example, a little bit of German, and you're looking at the translator, and you're seeing what it's doing and, and where it's messing up. Well, that was probably I'm guessing here, but I probably how some of those Bibles worked. Uh, they were more with Latin order and structure with German words, so it's very hard to read them. What Martin Luther did was he wrote it in German the way he said a German would say it. And it was a very readable Bible. And so the, um, the Luther Bible stands in German literature, something like the King James Bible or the authorized version, which is of course a, a 17th century English translation of the Bible, authorized by uh, you know King George of England, uh, King George, sorry, King James, <laughs> King James the first of England. Uh, and um, you know that for centuries was used, uh, really people learned to read from it, you know, they, everyone was very familiar with that language. Uh, same thing with uh, this German Bible, uh, it's very important for German literature. Um, now, we said he was a theologian, so he thought long and hard on questions of salvation. And uh, among his doctrines were the idea of salvation by faith rather than by good works. And also the idea that the Bible, Scripture, was the sole authority, not what the Pope said, not what the traditions of the church that had grown up said. Now, I will say this. Uh, he was a theologian. He had read you know, the, the early Christian and, and medieval authors um, who had common commented on the Bible, uh, the, the doctors of the church. He was very familiar with their, their writings. So I do think that when he read the Bible, you know, he had that background and uh, it had probably did uh, contribute to the way he interpreted the Bible. Um, one of the interesting things, of course, about this is uh, a lot of times people will read the Bible and they think, everybody will read it the same way that I do. And uh, that does not seem to be true. People do uh, come up with different interpretations. Okay, now we're getting back to the art. <laughs> now we're getting back to Dürer. And so the question that, you know, that we've been leading up to here is how did the Protestant Reformation affect Dürer? 
The simple answer is Dewar became a follower of Martin Luther. Now this is, you know, at a particular point in time. Uh, Dewar, as we saw with the Imitatio Christi, had been a good Christian, a good Catholic. Uh, you know, there wasn't that distinction of Catholic and Protestant. Uh, it, you know, he. He also was interested in spiritual matters. Uh, he painted many religious uh, works of art and uh, prints. Um, and you know, when he started reading what uh, Luther was writing and hearing about it, um, you know, he became a follower of Martin Luther. Um, oh, I don't know how much history to go into <laughs> with with you. Um, after. Um, Luther was, he went to the Diet of Worms, which is a, a council that took place at the city of the cathedral at Worms in Germany. Um, and, he, you know, he was called up by the authorities to answer for what they considered heresy. Um, he was condemned, but he had been given safe passage. And the emperor had promised that he would not be arrested and killed right there at the council. So he was allowed to leave, but the order was out that anybody could kill him, could arrest him. Uh, you know, he was a heretic, according to the church. And he disappeared. And nobody knew where he was for some time. As it turned out, and people thought he was dead, which was not true. Uh, Dewar writes in his diary at that time, Oh God, if Luther is dead, who will so clearly teach us the gospel? Erasmus of Rotterdam, unite of Christ, ride forth and win the martyr's crown. So basically he was, you know, he, he thought Luther was dead and there was no one who, who would teach us the gospel, you know, the words of God, words of Christ, uh, you know, so well as Luther, well, Erasmus of daughter then maybe he would do it. And the Knight of Christ refers to Erasmus's book, uh, the Handbook of the Christian Soldier. And of course, as I said, uh, Erasmus was not interested in being martyred. And if he was going to be martyred, it would be for Christ, not for Luther, as he said. So he didn't want to split up the church. He just wanted reforms, um, you know, getting away with simonry and presumably the, the, some of the more superstitious practices. Um, so, what happened next? Well, where, where was this Luther guy? Well, we're going to hear about that in, in, when I talk about Luther, Lucas Chronic, but just let's say he was uh, safe and uh, he came out of hiding a few years later and he brought with him his translation of the New Testament. While he was while he was disappeared, while he was incognito at Wurzburg Castle, uh, he wrote a translation of the New Testament. It was published in September, so it was called the September Testament. Um, and he used two sources. One was the Vulgate, the Latin Bible, uh, translated uh, from uh, the Greek uh, by uh, St. Jerome. And the other was the newly issued Greek New Testament, uh, you know, the new edition that came out that, by Erasmus of Rotterdam. You know, he uh, turned up with a scholarly edition. And those were the two things he used to translate the Bible into German. Um, so he comes out of hiding and he brings with him uh, this uh, this New Testament, which is is published and uh, we certainly makes a big big impact. Uh, in the inner, in the next uh, so many years, uh, he starts translating the Old Testament, and eventually, I think it's 1532, um, but he comes out with what's known as the Gansa Biblia, uh, the entire Biblia, uh, the entire Bible. Uh, the, both the Old and the New Testaments completely uh, in German and in readable German. Okay, what's all this got to do with Dewar? Well, I'm, like I said, I'm giving you an awful lot of historical background just to lead up to this. And incidentally, I suppose I should say this. Um, 
we deal with a lot of religious matters in art history classes, especially art history in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and, and in the Baroque period. Um, and you know, every once in a while you'll have a student that doesn't seem to understand that you're teaching history. You're not saying you're supposed to believe this or you're not supposed to believe this. Um, and you know, one time I even had a student say, oh, you shouldn't be talking about religion. I thought, well, how would I talk about the art? What would I do? Say, well, here's this picture. I can't tell you what it is or how it was used or, you know, what it meant its time or how it functioned or where it is, if it's still in a church, for example, or what the subject is. I can only describe the style. Uh, that's not art history. Art history is in the historical context. So, you know, I'm not telling you that you should believe any of the things that people at different points in history believed. I'm not telling you you shouldn't believe them. That's up to you. I'm talking about history and what I'm interested in is what the people of the time believed and how did that inform the painting? How did that relate to the works of art? So history, not propaganda. <laughs> okay. Um, this is the painting, you see two panels here, uh, by Albrecht Dürer, uh, which he painted in 1526. And it's been known traditionally as the Four Apostles. Uh, however, as we'll see, uh, it actually is uh, three apostles and two evangelists. Oh, John is both an apostle and an evangelist. Uh, and so some people say, well, wait, you know, it's not really four apost uh, apostles, there's three of them. Um, so some people will call it by other names. The four saints, well, that's pretty vague. The four holy men, that's pretty vague too. Um, so I'm continuing to use the, the misnomer, if you will, the sort of traditional title, because when you say Dewar's Four Apostles, you know exactly which work of art you're talking about, just because it's been called that for a long time. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, as you can see, you have two figures in each panel, one very large monumental figure uh, and another one uh, also monumental but behind the uh, foreground figure. And this composition is based on a painting uh, by Giovanni Bellini, which was um, you know, painted what, decades earlier, probably 1480s. I've seen a couple of dates that have been put on that, including around 1485, sometimes a little earlier. Um, and uh, here you see it, it's uh, the Frari Madonna, uh, the uh, uh, Madonna and Child that is in the church of Santa Maria Glorioso dei Frari uh, in Venice, uh, the Friars, the, uh, the Franciscan church in Venice. Uh, and you have Mary in the center uh, holding the Christ child. Uh, she's seated in the apse of a church with little angels. And then and this is what we're going to look at for uh, the comparison with Dewar. On either side, there are two standing saints. Oh, and I should also mention uh, that Dewar's paintings are, of course, oil paint on panel. Okay, so here blew up the, uh, uh, the Bellini pictures. Uh, you see four saints, four male saints standing uh, that fill up almost the whole space of the panel. Uh, there's a little more setting, you know, there's some columns and uh, some architecture in the background um, and a little bit of, little bit of landscape. Uh, and then uh, you have this you know, sort of one monumental figure with the other one uh, behind him uh, in the two different panels. So you have these overlapping monumental saints and Dewar seems to have remembered that or maybe he did some sketches when he was in Italy because he went down to Italy twice, um, but you know, many years before uh, this painting was painted uh, and he undoubtedly met Bellini. Um, you know, he he was welcomed in Italy. He actually went down uh, hoping to meet Montaigne, who was uh, not only a painter but a fellow printmaker. Uh, but unfortunately, Montaigne died while Dewar was on the way. Um, but you know, he's greeted by his his brother, his Montaigne's brother-in-law, Giovanni Bellini. Um, and I guess he got a quite a nice reception in Italy. So he knew. Bellini's, he could have certainly known Bellini's artwork. And this is the composition, similar to that. Now he's taken out all that architectural structure. It's just a dark background. 
He's put in something that's definitely not in, in uh, Bellini. Uh, there's no Madonna, for example. But also, can you see that band at the bottom? We're going to talk about uh, that. That's what's written on it. Okay. We kept saying monumental, you know, these big solid figures uh, which we associate with high Renaissance art. And this was not a commissioned painting. Um, Dewar painted it himself. He seems to have had an, an agenda, a reason. And then he went and presented it to his city, Nuremberg. Now, Nuremberg was a, by that time, had voted, the city council had voted that Nuremberg would be a Lutheran city. Okay, little explanation here. Uh, many of the towns, which some of which grew into cities, uh, were what they call free towns. They had rights. Uh, they might not answer directly to the local overlord, or they might, but they might also have certain rights that he couldn't do things to them that he could do to, say, his serfs. Um, Nuremberg was an imperial free city. Lots of rights, nominally under the rulership of the emperor. Now, the emperor was Charles V. Uh, he inherited the title of most, uh, what, most Catholic king uh, from his uh, grandfather, actually. Um, and he ruled Spain conquered uh, conquered Italy uh, and he was uh, the Holy Roman Emperor which was considered to be you know that he ruled much of Germany um, he wasn't in Germany a lot he was off doing things in other places so even though the Emperor was you know firmly Catholic um, Nuremberg kind of felt they could do what they wanted <laughs> And they, they decide they will have their city religion will be Lutheran. Um, they didn't have something to think as a Lutheran church then, but they would be following Luther's ideas. Now, this is Dewar's home city. Remember, Luther is very much, uh, excuse me, Dewar is very much in favor of uh, uh, the, the teachings of uh, Martin Luther. And we see this as a work of art in which he's expressing that idea, and he's expressing it specifically to the city. So why? Well, let's first look at these um, saints who are portrayed here. Uh, on the left, you have St. John the Evangelist. He's the young, beardless saint, uh, and St. Peter. And I should explain to you um, what an apostle means. With an exception, the apostles are the 12 disciples of Jesus. And they go off to preach the gospel. Now, Judas Iscariot uh, betrayed Christ, so he's taken out of that group. Uh, they did elect, uh, I think it's Matthias, uh, another apostle to take his place. However, as we'll see, uh, St. Paul is also known as an apostle. Peter is the apostle to the Jews. St. Paul is the apostle to the Gentile world because he was born in Tarsus and was a uh, Roman citizen. So we'll see Paul in a minute. Uh, so the 12 disciples and Paul are essentially the apostles. Um, we see John, the evangelist, in this very prominent position. And then Peter, who is the first bishop of Rome, uh, the, the first pope, is behind John. And we know it's, we know it's definitely it's Peter. He's holding the key, the key of the kingdom of heaven, uh, which is his attribute. And also, uh, it will, the inscription below uh, confirms that. Um, and so, you know, people are looking for sort of a, a kind of... Uh, you know, Protestant slant to this, um, they can say that Peter, who's the first pope, is standing behind John. So it's like the pope is in a lesser position. You know, he's not the most prominent thing here. And the gospel of St. John was Luther's favorite gospel. 
So, you know, maybe the arrangement uh, suggests a possible uh, Lutheran interpretation. And then here we have St. Paul. He's the figure in white. And he's holding the sword because he was um, martyred by having his head struck off. Uh, he could not be crucified because it was illegal to crucify a Roman citizen. Uh, and then behind him is St. Mark. Now, St. Mark is the one person who isn't an, uh, is not an apostle in this, in this painting. Uh, one person in the painting who's not an apostle. Uh, he's an evangelist or a writer of one of the four gospels or the four first books of the Christian uh, section of the Bible that is called the New Testament. And um, the four first books of the New Testament, the gospels as they're called, um, tell the life of Christ. So you have Matthew, Mark, here's Mark, Luke, and John. Now, Paul would be, oftentimes in, in medieval art, you see Peter and Paul, you know, the two chief apostles, you know, right there very prominently. Here we saw Peter was being pushed back a bit. Uh, and, and, you know, Protestants aren't against Peter. Uh, they just don't like what the popes made of him, I guess, uh, the, the, the authorities that they claim based on Peter. Um, Luther's doctrine of salvation by faith was based on uh, Paul's epistle to the Romans in the Bible. And so this may account for why he is so prominent. He was someone who was uh, you know, very important to Luther. Uh, he actually came upon this um, doctrine uh, as uh, he's preparing uh, his class on Romans. So he's doing his research, I guess you could say. Um, and in English, this verse from the Bible would translate, we hold that man will be justified without the works of the law, but by faith alone. Well, I was real curious about this because the word faith means so many different things in English. Uh, it can mean trust. You know, Christ says if you have faith as a little child, which presumably is referring to the trust that children have. Um, you know, it can mean loyalty. Um, it can mean uh, belief. You know, some people say that you, you know, if you have faith, you believe certain things. They have a list of doctrines that you're supposed to believe. And so I was curious to see what German word Luther used. And so here I just have the German for just this last little phrase. Allein druck den Glauben. And you can see allein means alone. Druck is through. And then Glauben means belief. So... When he says, uh, you know, alone through den Glauben, alone through faith or alone through belief. Now, one of the interesting things that people have pointed out, I didn't find this out myself. I read it when I was looking into, I guess I, when I was looking into some of my research uh, for courses, um, that the word, say, solo in Latin, alone, or the equivalent word that means alone in Greek, are not in the Bible. They're not in the Greek text. They're not in the Latin text. And of course, uh, the New Testament, from which this is from, was written down in the literary language, langu the literary language of the ancient world, which was Greek. Um, Latin was seen as more colloquial at that time. Um, you know, in the fourth century. Yeah. Yeah. So. So in the fourth century, you know, it was translated from Greek into Latin, where which more people spoke and read. Now, how does Luther account for the fact that he added a word, which you know seems to me to change the meaning? You know, uh, we're not justified that man will be justified without the works of the law, but by faith. And then he adds alone. It's you know emphasis, as it were. Nothing else, just let that, faith alone. Um, when confronted with this criticism, uh, Luther said, I wrote it the way a German would say it. You know, 
So his reading of the text, he felt it called for that additional emphasis. Um, and there is a competing uh, text in the Bible uh, in uh, the book, the Epistle of James, um, that says faith without works is dead. So there's those you know, two <laughs> Bible verses, if you might say, fighting it out between them. And uh, of course, uh, you know, Christians often discuss this, you know, the question of faith and works. Okay, why all this background about the Luther Bible? Because in this painting by Albrecht Dürer, at the bottom of the painting, I mentioned those bands, you can see they're in a lighter color. Um, the inscriptions at the bottom contain verses from the Luther Bible, literally the Luther New Testament, because the entire Bible, um, parts of it, parts of the Old Testament had been published, but basically the um, September Testament had come out about four years before. And um, that's the New Testament. And then the entire Bible wasn't published until after Dewar's death in uh, um, the 1530s. I want to say 32, but I might be wrong about that last number. Uh, I, have to, I have to go look it up. <laughs> uh, at any rate, uh, you have writing from the Luther Bible or from the Luther New Testament so in German. What are these verses about? Well, they all seem to be warnings against extremism or against false prophets. So then the question is, now what's Luther done? He's given this, these two panels, these painting, to the city of Nuremberg. Evidently he has, as I said, an agenda. He has something he's trying to tell the city fathers with this. And presumably it's contained in the inscription. So he's warning them against extremism. He's warning them against false prophets. So then, you know, historians go and try to figure out who did he mean? Who were these false prophets? And of course, some people say, well, they were Catholics. Uh, some people say they were the radical Protestants, especially the iconoclasts. And some say, but we're both. You know, that Dewar would have seen the Catholics as extreme in one way, the more radical Protestants as extreme in another way, and both as false prophets. Uh, he believed that Luther, you know, was the, the middle or the, the truth. Um, now, I wanted to talk to you about iconoclasm. Who are these radical Protestants? Um, sometimes they divide uh, different denominations into high church and low church. Uh, these are Protestant denominations. Uh, uh, the Anglicans, the Episcopalians, of course these come a bit later than this, but it's still the 16th century. Uh, and then uh, the Lutherans are considered to be high church. And then the low church are, uh, you know, what, Baptists, uh, well, Methodists don't come in until the 18th century, but, uh, you know, some of the other uh, Protestant groups. Uh, Calvinists, you know, Presbyterians, or uh, Dutch Reform, you know, all these. These are the low, supposedly the low churches. Uh, any rate, uh, high and low is talking about, I think, the level of ritual <laughs> and some of the ideas. Uh, for example, their rea reaction to the uh, Holy Sacrament, the so-called low churches uh, do not believe that the uh, bread and wine is really the body and blood of Christ. Uh, we talked about that before with Tintoretto. Okay, let's talk about iconoclasm. Some, not all of the Protestants, but some of them were iconoclasts. Iconoclast literally means image breakers. And um, it comes out of a much earlier period in history um, between 726 and 843, which is the period called the Iconoclastic Controversy, and this is in the Eastern Church um, in which um, emperors came who were image breakers, and then of course later uh, the Iconoduels, uh, the image venerators, uh, eventually uh, in what, 843, um, you had a Iconodulist um, emperor who came in. So this whole, you know, over a century of uh, 
you know, periods where, for the most part, there were some exceptions when some of the empresses ruled, but uh, uh, religious art was um, destroyed. Okay, what's this got to do with the uh, 16th century? Because without quite as much theological underpinning, the same thing happened. Some of the Protestants were image breakers, iconoclasts. They believed that religious art was idolatry and it should be destroyed. Religious art. Now you can have, I guess, a secular art, but religious art, they sometimes would riot and go into the church and just take out and smash and burn art. Um, there are places in Germany um, and well, now Switzerland, um, but it was German then, in which the iconoclast destroyed all the religious art. So those places have no art before the Reformation. It's been destroyed. Now, Dewar is an artist. Is he going to think that art is idolatry? Probably not. So it does seem likely that he's warning the city against that kind of extremism. Now, what did Nuremberg do? Well, Nuremberg did not want the riots. Uh, he did not want civil unrest. So essentially, they told people, you know, if it's your family chapel, you know, come and pick up the art. You know, on a certain day, we're going to destroy it. And that way, you know, we won't have these iconoclastic riots. Luther was not opposed to religious art. Uh, his attitude does seem to change. Um, early on, it's kind of like, well, if it really offends you, okay, you know, you destroy it. Um, but you, he doesn't really see why you have to because he doesn't really think of the art as uh, quite as powerful <laughs> as some of the iconoclasts did. But he has a good friend, uh, Lucas Cronick, and his ideas change. So eventually, Luther says things like, well, wine and women can lead men, men astray, but we don't pour out all the wine and kill all the women. In other words, you know, yeah, I suppose you, you, know, you could start worshiping an image, you know, maybe if you weren't really smart, <laughs> but, you know, uh, but that could lead you astray, but you know, it's not really the art's fault. Uh, it's you know, your use of it. Um, so, you know, why should we destroy the art? Um, and he, he seems to come to realize that art can be a very powerful message. He says, well, when I'm thinking of the crucifixion of Christ, I have an image in my head of a man on the cross. And I can't not think of that image and still contemplate, you know, the, the death of Christ. So, you know, what's the difference between the image in my head and the image, you know, in, in, in paint or sculpture? Um, so, as I say, Luther was not opposed to uh, religious images uh, the way some of the iconoclasts were. He was not a, a, an iconoclast at all. Um, the Lutheran message here, of course, is in the text. And um, incidentally, I should tell you that not all the art was burnt and destroyed in Nuremberg. Um, there is, for example, this wonderful sculpture of the Annunciation and the Rosary by uh, uh, Weitstoss, and uh, they put a bag on it, quite literally. They had a wrapping of cloth uh, that that they would cover it up in Lent, and so they did that so that the you know the more iconoclastic people would not be tempted to destroy it, <laughs> uh, and it has survived. It's still there, uh, and certain other works are still there. Um, by painting a work of art with a Lutheran message, in the sense of, you know, watch out for these extremists like Catholics and radicals, uh, Dewar is showing that, you know, Protestant art is possible. And of course, you know, some works people try to find a Protestant meaning in them. Um, the person who really developed Protestant iconography, however, as we'll see, is uh, Lucas Cronick. What was the effect of the Protestant Reformation on art? Well, with iconoclasm and Protestant objections to religious art, the art market was severely reduced in Protestant countries. I mean, you could pay portraits. It, there wasn't enough unrest that people would even want them. Um, 
you know, and, uh, some, as we'll see, secular, there's, you know, more types of secular art develop. But the biggest part of the art market had, what, for centuries, been religious art. We talked about the Ghent altarpiece as, uh, what, a way to help save Jodicus Witt and his wife, souls. Um, you know, that this was a good deed. Uh, and now, the artists, that whole art market had dried up. What did artists do to earn a living? Well, many artists were forced out of work. Um, there's you know, horrible stories of artists who would become, become mercenary soldiers because uh, you know, they're too old to apprentice in another field. Um, you know, people aren't taking, you know, 40-year-old painters and teaching them how to be bakers. You know, they, they aren't doing that. Um, and so, you know, they have to find some way to survive. Um, however, the very best of the artists, the ones we'd have in our survey classes, that are, you know, will survive. Uh, for Dewar, you know, he, he, he didn't live very much lo longer after that. He, it, you know, he, uh, he died in 1528. So, you know, he didn't get the brunt of iconoclasm, for one thing. He was also so very famous. He painted uh, portraits of people, um, religious art, uh, still sometimes, and uh, his prints. Of course, the, the iconoclasts really weren't as worried about prints um, because, after all, who's going to worship a black and white image? You know, who's going to worship a print? Uh, they don't, you, you can't think that's really, you know, the Queen of Heaven or something. Um, so, you know, he didn't live that much longer and, and his works, uh, you know, he survived, fine. Other artists uh, survived who worked for aristocratic courts or the bishop's court or the elector's court. Uh, for example, Lucas Cronick uh, works for the elector of Saxony. Um, Hans Holbein, as we'll hear, becomes the court painter to Henry VIII of England. Other artists worked for Catholic patrons in Catholic areas. Not every area in Germany was Protestant. There were certain areas that were firmly Catholic. They were ruled by archbishops, for example. Um, and um, Matthias Neithart Gotthard, who's known to us as Grunewald, uh, worked for Catholic patrons. And what was surprising was when he died, forbidden Lutheran books were found in his effects, including, I think, a Luther Bible and a sermon. Um, and so we don't know, was he a secret Protestant or, you know, was he just so curious about this that he would uh, take the risk of having some of Luther's writings uh, in his possession? Um, some artists worked for both. I mean... Chronic, as we'll see, created Catholic art. He worked for uh, Cardinal Brandenburg. Uh, he created classical art, secular art, and he also created Protestant art. So lots of different types of art. And we want to continue and talk to you about Hans Holbein the Younger.